It's a great pleasure to be with you this, uh, this day to uh, discuss, I think, work that all of us are passionate about uh, and feel that uh, there's still much to be done. Um, and so what I want to do today uh, to conclude our, our panel discussion is to uh, expand our conversation about what diversity means um, and what diversity means in terms of uh, the changing demographics in not only public education, uh, but also higher education. Um, and so what I will do is I will highlight the experiences of undocumented students. Um, increasingly, we have been paying attention to issues related to higher education access. Um, and uh, an issue that has come in the education of Latino and immigrant youth um, is this growing concern with the um, educational access of children who were brought by their parents at a very young age, um, who grew up in this country uh, with an American identity, with English being their primary language, um, deeply believing in the American dream that um, their parents embraced and which brought them to this country, um, but that at the end of their public education experience, uh, they are met not only with uncertainty, uh, but with a sense of despair uh, because of the limited options that they have available. So the images that you see here and the images that I've uh, included in the slides um, are, I think, a, a, a symbol of um, the mobilization that has begun by undocumented students themselves. Part of it as a result of the frustration of the lack of immigration reform uh, and as a result, a lack of higher education access, um, but also it speaks to the organizational genius, the academic talent, and the promise that these students hold uh, for uh, contributing to American society. Um, and, and part of the discourse, uh, and, and when I talk about this work uh, with audiences, is to highlight precisely what we stand to lose um, if we fail to do anything to support uh, undocumented students, not only access to higher education, but also providing a path uh, to legalization. So just to give you a sense of you know, what are we talking about in terms of the, the, the children and young adults that are affected by this legal uh, limbo. Um, estimates are that there are about 3.2 million children and young adults under the age of 24 living in the United States without legal status. About half of those are enrolled uh, in K-12 schooling. And uh, our best estimates are that every year, 65,000 students graduate from American high schools uh, facing a very uncertain future because of their lack of legal status. In 1975, uh, several school districts uh, in the state of Texas, in fact, uh, tried to bar um, undocumented children from enrolling, enrolling in public schools. Uh, these practices were challenged uh, in the courts uh, by several civil rights organizations, uh, MALDEV among others. Um, and seven years later, that case came be before the Supreme Court of the United States uh, in the famous case now known as Plyler Doe, where the Supreme Court, using the Equal Protection Clause, argued that um, not only was it unconstitutional to exclude children from public education based on their immigration status, but that in fact it was in the compelling interest of the state to educate undocumented children. That the state uh, didn't know whether in the future these children would become legalized and by excluding them from public education it would be a disabling uh, condition uh, if they were not provided access to public education. That mandate still holds true today um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, undocumented children are able to go through the public educational system, um, but that Supreme Court case only holds for public education so that when they graduate, those 65,000 students every year um, lose that constitutional guarantee of educational access. So just how much does it impact higher education access um, being uh, undocumented? Uh, this table that I pulled from a report that was released last year by the Pew Hispanic Center 
shows that if you compare uh, immigrant children who have legal status to those that don't have legal status, and these are between the ages of 18 and 24, so these are sort of the traditional college-going years, that if you compare those populations that have legal status and those that don't, that if you look at, um, for example, those that have less than a high school degree uh, in the age range, whereas only 15% of children, of, of young adults who have legal status um, have less than a high school education, that percentage uh, is 40% for those without legal status. If we look on the other side of that spectrum, whereas 60% of legal status immigrant youth have either a college degree or some college experience, that percentage is only 26% for those without uh, legal status. So the impact on higher education access is, is dramatic and significant. Um, and it's a reason why an increasing number of researchers and policymakers are concerned with, uh, with their higher education access. Um, because what happens is not only do they not qualify for federal financial aid, and in, in many states they are treated as international student, students, um, but they also they cannot legally work um, and they may be deported at any time. And given that, and it's a very real uh, possibility, given that under this administration we have had the largest number of uh, deportations and, and workplace raids uh, that we've had in previous administrations. Um, and so for them, this is a fear that they live constantly with, not only as children uh, worrying whether their parents are going to be home, but also young adults as they reach that critical transition period, uh, they don't know if they're going to be um, sent to a country that they have virtually no memory of and, and no uh, ties to. So the work that I've done um, uh, sort of highlights that this is in fact a, a loss of talent and there are numerous uh, newspaper articles uh, that uh, have, you know, uh, described and characterized uh, valedictorians and honor students who are not able to pursue a higher education because of their legal status. Um, and so one of the emerging trends with undocumented students who are able to pursue higher education, which is a small percentage, yet despite that small, those small numbers, they've been able to create a national uh, movement, a national advocacy movement on behalf of the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act is really sort of this piece of legislation that has galvanized uh, these highly talented students to advocate and push for education and immigration reform. Um, and whereas the DREAM Act is sort of the federal arena where we can, do, uh, we can change uh, the, the, the circumstances of undocumented students, um, so the states have been working on this for a, a very long time, at least 10 years of policies that have opened access to higher education for undocumented students. Um, also, colleges and universities um, have created institutional policies as well. So basically what the DREAM Act would do if it were to come into law, uh, which it almost did uh, about a month ago, is for children who came before the age of 15, who have graduated from high school, who go to college for two years or serve in the military for two years, um, at that point when they meet all of those requirements, uh, they receive permanent legal residence um, and five years later they can formally apply for, um, for uh, naturalized citizenship. Um, and that's really sort of what's been driving uh, the advocacy on the part of undocumented students themselves. Um, also, um, before, uh, for the past 10 years, uh, there are now 11 states, Wisconsin being the most recent one, that has provided in-state tuition legislation for undocumented students to pursue um, higher education. Uh, in Texas and New Mexico, those states have gone a step further and provided state funds for children to also uh, uh, be able to pay for uh, their higher education uh, expenses. But I think a more important recent development is an increasing number of private colleges and universities. And this isn't, this isn't a complete list, this is just a partial list. Um, and as you can see, these are among the most selective and prestigious colleges and universities in this country. They recognize the potential, they recognize the, the, the travesty 
um, of, uh, of the lack of higher education access and, and citizenship for undocumented students. And so they provide uh, full funding for undocumented students who get accepted based on their merit. Um, just the other, just two weeks ago, there was an article in, 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 the, in the newspaper about at the University of Pennsylvania, the incoming class had 17 undocumented students who were incoming freshmen. Um, I was just at a conference at Pomona College, um, and at Pomona College there were 13 freshmen who were part of the incoming class. So private colleges, because they don't have a lot of the constraints that public institutions have, um, have been able to provide educational access for undocumented students. And so that has increased the cadre of undocumented students in higher education who have mobilized and created a greater awareness. And I think it provides an opportunity for undocumented students to interact with legal scholars who are working on this area, for other advocacy groups who are working on changing um, existing legislation. Um, because this is an increasingly, um, uh, increasingly an issue that impacts not just traditionally immigrant receiving states like California and Texas and Florida. In fact, there's an emerging trend now that is being characterized by social scientists as the immigrant diaspora. So places like North Carolina, South Carolina, Iowa, uh, Georgia, places that historically have not been immigrant receiving countries and now are, uh, now are seeing an influx, a double digit increases in the immigrant population, which means that local school districts and local institutions of higher education must also contend with the issue. Um, and I think that um, with the partnerships between legal scholars and social scientists and advocates, um, that's really, I think, the key strategy that's going to help us to finally address this issue. And I'm pleased to hear sort of this is one of the consistent themes in, in the conversations that we've had up to this point. Um, so I look forward to engaging with you on that um, when we have the Q&A. Thank you very much for your time.